Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Bruce, and I'm the Land Stewardship Coordinator for the Brewster Conservation Trust. And today, I'll be talking with you about From the Ground Up, Saving the Birds and the Bees, and how restoring the pillars of our ecosystems can help solve today's most pressing issues. Uh, and so for those of you who are unaware, the Brewster Conservation Trust was founded in 1983 as a response to the rapid development threatening the natural beauty of the Cape. Uh, to date, the trust has protected over 1,450 acres on over 200 parcels of land, including the Eddie Sisters property where most of the photos <laughs> of this presentation were taken, just so happens to be my favorite property. Uh, and so we are charged with the mission to preserve open space, natural resources, and the rural character of Brewster, and to promote a conservation ethic. And that's what I hope each of you can come home with you today, uh, a conservation ethic. And so what are we going to be talking about? Well, first, I'm going to start off by uh, making everyone a little bit sad, and a little bit depressed by talking about some of the major environmental issues facing us today as a society. Uh, I'm going to focus in on one of those, biodiversity loss, and I'm going to talk about why it matters, the drivers, and uh, what we can do, how do we start, where do we go, and then I'm going to end with, some, uh, part, with a parting message and some final takeaways. And so what are the issues? Uh, well, they are complex and multifaceted. Uh, they are water quality, degradation, climate change, and biodiversity loss. And these are issues that are facing, uh, facing everybody across the globe. And they're large. The causes of them are deep within our culture and the things that we do as a society. And they compound and make each other worse. And so it, they're, they're pretty serious problems. Uh, and so what does that look like on the Cape? Uh, well, for water quality, uh, that comes in the form of cyanobacteria and algae blooms. These are driven primarily through uh, nutrient pollution from um, leaking septic tanks. Uh, about 85% of the nutrient pollution, which includes nitrogen and phosphorus, comes from septic tanks, while the other 15% comes from fertilizer use, uh, of which homeowners, um, have the lion's share. 80% of fertilizer use comes from homeowner, homeowners, or the other 20% is things like golf courses. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, this is a problem because uh, the Cape is sits on top of what's known as a sole source aquifer. Um, that means everybody on the Cape, uh, regardless of the town, gets their drinking water from the same exact spot. And, and that spot is directly below our feet. Uh, and so that means everything that gets uh, poured into the ground, whether it's our septic tanks or oil or pesticides, any of that, that eventually finds its way into our water bodies, into our uh, drinking water supply. Um, and this is important because our freshwater ponds and, and uh, lakes, they are sort of a, a little lens into our drinking water supply. They can kind of show us if what we're doing is having an effect on the environment. And, and as we've seen, um, every summer, more and more ponds and lakes across the Cape uh, have to be shut down because of these algae blooms. Uh, and with every, with every algae bloom, our ponds move closer and closer to a dead, unproductive ecosystem. Uh, and that's a problem, not only for our drinking water supply, uh, but also our economy. Uh, the Cape is what's known as a blue economy. So Everything we do from development to um, restaurants and things like that, they rely on um, having clean and safe natural resources. The next one is climate change. Uh, and this is the greatest issue facing us today as a society. Uh, some of the impacts that we're gonna see on the Cape and uh, in New England as a whole, um, include longer and more intense droughts, like the one we sustained over the last summer. Um, it was to the point where almost the entire state was in a critical drought, a uh, level three. Now, over the last couple of weeks, some of that has subsided due to some more rainfall. Uh, it's still uh, pretty bad, unfortunately. Um, and then you combine that with longer and more intense heat waves where we're gonna have to start seeing more and more days above 90 degrees. And those are dangerous temperature conditions. People die um, in conditions like that. And that's just gonna start cooking everything around us. All of the, all of our woodlands and flowers and your stuff at your garden, which is going through a drought right now, we're just gonna start getting cooked more and more due to these heat waves. Uh, 
Uh, and then tied into that, we're going to start seeing more frequent and severe weather. We're going to start seeing more severe thunderstorms, more nor'easters, things like that. And New England as a whole is expected to receive more rainfall overall. But unfortunately, it's not going to arrive in the way that we need it during the summer and a nice soaking couple days rain here or there. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to arrive in abruptly in very intense and severe storms, um, such as what we saw in Providence, Rhode Island, where eight and a half inches of rain was dropped within a few hours, or what we saw in Dallas or Kentucky or Pakistan, where a third of the country is underwater because of these intense storms. Um, and those are things that we're going to be dealing with and that we're already dealing with, and it's just going to get worse from here. Uh, and then the last one is biodiversity loss. Uh, nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history, and there's an estimated a million species are now threatened with extinction in the coming decades. Uh, that's from a 2019 report from the United Nations Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, and that's fairly worrying. Uh, some of those species include things like the birds, like the song sparrow pictured here at the Eddie Sisters property. Over the last 50 years, North America has lost 3 billion birds. That's 25% of the entire bird population. Uh, nowadays, we hear the word billion a lot, so it kind of lost its meaning. So just to give you some perspective, 1 million seconds ago was 11 and a half days ago, while 1 billion seconds ago was 32 years ago. So three billion birds, that's a lot of birds. Again, that's one in four birds gone since the 1970s. Uh, it's another silent spring. Uh, it also includes things like the bees and other bugs. 28% uh, of bumblebee species are at risk of extinction, including the golden northern bumblebee picture here at the Eddie Sisters property. Uh, it also includes things like the rusty patch bumblebee, which was the first bee added to the endangered species list. It used to be all over uh, the United States and now it's only in a select areas out in the Midwest and maybe a couple other spots in uh, New England, but you won't be able to find it on the Cape anymore. Uh, some studies have suggested that globally insect populations have declined nearly 25% since 1990 and 50% since the 1940s. So it's not just bees, it's insects as a whole. Uh, and that's a big problem, um, mostly because bees, birds, and other insects, well, they are a litmus test for how the rest of the environment and food web are doing. Uh, they provide billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of ecosystem services like pest control or pollination uh, to the economy annually. Uh, bees pollinate one third of our crops and, some, and are some of our most efficient pollinators. Uh, pollinators include things like house flies, like moths and butterflies, uh, but also bats and birds and beetles, those sorts of things. But um, bees are far and beyond our most efficient pollinators. Uh, and 90% of flowering plants rely on insects for pollination. So they rely on insects uh, in order to reproduce and start spreading. So if those are declining, that means other things uh, in the system are declining. Um, and that's not great because biodiversity is what makes our ecosystems resilient to things like disturbances, like the wildfires, like the floods and the droughts, things that we're gonna be seeing a lot more of in the coming years due to uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, resilient ecosystems can continue to function um, they can take a couple hits and continue to provide, provide the ecosystem services to us. They can continue to clean our air and clean our drinking water and lower our ambient air temperature. Uh, but the more stresses add up and the less biodiverse those are, um, the less and less are able to do those until eventually the whole thing falls apart. And so what are some of the drivers of this biodiversity? loss. Um, they include things like habitat loss, pesticide use, and invasive species. Uh, and really what all of these boil down to, it's a breakdown in the food web and the ecological interactions and relationships. Uh, so what's happening is you're getting a breakdown of this. Um, food webs show a transfer of energy in an ecosystem. Uh, and you start down here with our green plants. And you can see that the insects eat the green plants and then the spiders eat the insects and then so on and so forth. Uh, and so what each of these drivers are doing is they're breaking down certain parts of that food web 
uh, and then that's going to have an effect on the rest of them. And I'm going to get into that right now. Uh, so habitat loss, what does that look like? Uh, on the Cape, um, that's things like development. Um, according to Mass Audubon's uh, losing ground report, between uh, the years 2012 and 2017, three and a half, 13 and a half acres of land in Massachusetts were developed every single day. That's things like houses and roads and swimming pools, you know, um, shopping, shopping centers. Uh, those are acres of woods or grasslands or whatever being raised over and built on. Uh, you know, if you're familiar, the Cape does have a housing crisis. So a part of that development is certainly necessary, but it, part of that development also ties into how we also treat those lands. You know, if we have five acres of woods that then get raised over and we have a bunch of houses on it, you know, that's great. But with those houses come acres and acres of lawn as well, which is also a dead ecosystem, you know? Um, and it's not only development, it's also forest succession. Uh, if you're unaware, uh, the Capes, Pitch Pine and Oak uh, Woodlands, they're what's known as a fire influence community. And so in uh, pre-colonial times, um, low grade wildfires would periodically roll through the Cape and its woodlands, either sparked by the indigenous people here or uh, lightning. And what that would do is it would clear out a lot of the underbrush um, as well as kill some of the trees and allow the Cape to look more of like a, a mosaic uh, system full of grasslands and shrublands and younger forests as well as older forests. Um, and that was really important. Those grasslands and things are really important for a lot of uh, species, including the grasshopper sparrow um, pictured here. Unfortunately, with uh, the development boom uh, and changes in forest management, you know, we no longer like fire uh, creeping in in our backyards and for good reason. Uh, a lot of those grasslands that weren't developed, um, a lot of those old fields uh, that were just abandoned, um, those slowly and naturally just creep their way towards um, forests. So they went from grasslands to shrubs to forests and those grasslands were lost. Uh, and so with them were the species that depend on them. Uh, the grasshopper sparrow, uh, their populations declined 70% since 1970. Uh, it's not just them, it's also things like the Eastern Meadowlark, uh, New England Blazing Star, the Frosted Elfin Moth. Uh, there are a lot of species with the same sort of story. So what we're, what's happening is that we're removing the habitats and we're seeing a loss in the insects that depend on them. And then we're seeing less spiders and toads and mice and snakes and chipmunks and owls and deer and skunks and coyotes. We're seeing a breakdown in the food web because of removing one of those aspects of biodiversity, removing the supports. Um, and then fungi just hang out because, you know, <laughs> Honestly, they grow in the Chernobyl nuclear reactor feeding on the radiation. So I'm pretty sure they'll be everywhere for no forever. <laughs> and then the other one is pesticide use on the Cape. Uh, that comes in the form of homeowner pesticide use. You know, it's people dumping pesticides on their lawn to kill the grubs or uh, they're hiring people like this um, Mosquito Joe to come in. <laughs> come and carpet bomb their woods to treat things like ticks and mosquitoes. Uh, unfortunately, what these companies don't tell you is that these chemicals, uh, the synthetic chemicals that they have, and even the natural ones that um, are used to target the ticks and mosquitoes, well, they also target everything else. Uh, they target the pollinators, they target the caterpillars, they target the fireflies, the dragonflies, they target things that naturally control mosquitoes, like the dragonflies and the fireflies. Uh, and the lace wings and the hoverflies and you, all of these things that are natural predators uh, that keep mosquito populations in check are now uh, decimated because, um, because we applied pesticides to kill one specific insect. Uh, and this is a problem because 96% of terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. Um, and so what we're seeing here is we're eliminating the insects and then we eliminate the spiders and the toads and the mice and the snakes and the chipmunks and the owls and the skunks and the coyotes. And we're eliminating some of the plants. Uh, like I said, 90% of flowering plants depend on insects for pollination. So without the insects, those things can't reproduce and then we get less green plants. Uh, you also lose things like chipmunks and squirrels, which um, other species of trees rely on for reproduction. 
Um, you know, the squirrels and the chipmunks, they bury acorns and pine cones and berries all across the forest. And that allows our shrubs and trees uh, to expand and grow. And so once we get rid of those, we also lose things like deer. And then over there, the fungi just hang out. <laughs> Uh, and then the last one is invasive species. If you have ever spoken to me or if you know me at all, you know I'm very passionate about uh, the plight that is invasive species. Uh, and what do I, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, an invasive plant, and um, an invasive species is something that did not evolve in the local ecosystem. It didn't grow, it didn't evolve on the Cape, it didn't uh, evolve in North America, and it does not have any natural predators or contribute to wildlife in any way. Uh, most insects that eat plants can only develop and reproduce on the plants with which they share an evolutionary history. And because these things didn't evolve there, there is no evolutionary history there. And so they don't provide anything to the insects and they don't have any natural predators. They have nothing eating them. And so what happens is that these things that were brought here either on purpose or, act, or accidentally, well, they start to grow and they start to expand and move into our conservation areas, like pictured here at Quivet Marsh. Phragmites is one of the most common ones. It has invaded the entire Eastern seaboard and it's moving further and further west. Um, what Phragmites does is it invades salt marshes and other freshwater areas or, and freshwater areas. Um, and it replaces a diverse salt marsh ecosystem, which had dozens of different plant species supporting dozens of different other organisms all throughout the food chain. Uh, it's outcompeting them, pushing them out, and replacing it with a one species that doesn't contribute anything. So you go from dozens and dozens and dozens of organisms, a really biodiverse system, to one species. Um, and that's a, that's a problem. And so what we're doing is we're eliminating the plants and we're eliminating the insects that depend on the plants and the spiders and then the toads and the mice and snakes and chipmunks and owls and deer and skunks and coyotes. And then of course, the fungi just hang out. And so what you can see here is that each one of these drivers is affecting a different part of this food web. And because it's doing that, it's affecting all of the others. And so you must be thinking, Damn, John, like, what can I do? I'm pretty sad now. I say, well, don't worry. What you can do is plant native. Uh, native plants are the pillars of our ecosystem, and they are the, and incorporating native plants into our landscapes are one of the most important things that you can do as an individual to help solve a lot of these issues. Uh, and that's because uh, it addresses biodiversity loss because, you know, plants have they share that evolutionary history with the insects around them. You know, plants develop chemical defenses to avoid being eaten. You can think of like things like poison ivy or poison hemlock or even greenbrier. You know, they have those, they have those things to keep, uh, keep the insects off of them. Uh, but their moth and butterfly species have uh, developed ways to bypass these defenses. Um, things like our monarch butterfly pictured here. What they do is that they, uh, they can eat the toxic milkweed and they use those toxic compounds um, as their own defense system. They store them in their body uh, and that wards off predators um, and birds and things like that. Um, and it's not just monarchs. It's also the primrose moth <laughs> pictured here on evening primrose at the Hay Conservation Center, um, as well as the um, American skipper that um, requires, or excuse me, the golden, uh, the uh, copper admiral or the red admiral, which uh, requires stinging nettle, or the painted lady, which requires things like field pussy toes, which is pictured in uh, my backyard here. All of these require certain species of plants because they evolutionarily, they developed plant, uh, they developed ways to counteract the plant defenses. Um, and that's really important because a lot of like, uh, a lot of birds require things like caterpillars uh, to rear their young. You know, caterpillars are these soft little protein packed pills that uh, require a lot of nutrients or uh, provide a lot of nutrients. And so the more caterpillars you have, the more birds you have and the more uh, caterpillars, the more pollinators uh, and the more dragonflies and just the more biologically diverse system. And so with more caterpillars, you get nine times the amount of um, rare birds, three times more butterfly species, more native bees those sorts of things. 
And like I said, we need uh, caterpillars uh, because um, things like the black cap chickadee, well, they require six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one clutch of chicks. So that's a lot. And to provide those kinds of numbers, well, we need a really strong foundation. Um, and you gotta, uh, to, to circle back a little bit, we need that strong foundation because that food web that I was showing is also similar to a food pyramid. Uh, we, need, we need a strong support system to carry that energy throughout each of those levels. And that's because most of the energy in between each of the levels, between the producers and the primary consumers, most of that gets lost to heat. And it's actually really only about 10% of the energy in each level gets transferred to the next. And that's why things like black cap chickadees need so many caterpillars uh, because they are only getting a small slice of that energy. Um, and so how do we provide those numbers? Well, we do that with keystone native plants. Uh, Doug Tallamy, one of the, uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy, one of the main researchers behind the native plant um, push, uh, him and his team identified 14% of native plants support 90% of butterfly and moth Lepidoptera species. So that means, uh, so they are so named keystones as in uh, the Roman keystone arch. That one stone uh, holds up the rest of them. And so, like I said, 14 percent native plants hold up the rest of that arch. And it's the same thing with um, herbaceous plants and native bees. Uh, 15 to 60 percent of North American native bees can only eat pollen on 40 percent of native plants. That's due to things like the length of the tongue and how deep the petals are, that sort of thing. Uh, and so keystone plants are really, you know, native keystone plants are, have a really significant impact on uh, the environment. And so what are some of those? Well, luckily for us, it's things like our native oak, which uh, pictured here uh, supports 436 caterpillar species. Um, 436 different species of caterpillars use oak trees as their host plant, similar to the monarch and everything. Uh, and it's also our blueberry bushes. 217 species of caterpillars use our blueberry bushes like high bush blueberry. Uh, as their host plant. Uh, blueberry bushes also support about 14 specialist uh, bee species. Um, they are made just right, so these specialist bees can go in and collect that pollen and the nectar and everything. Uh, and they're really important early season sources. A lot of things just coming out of hibernation um, are looking for a quick fix, and blueberries are the ones that bloom, are one of the earliest bloomers. So that's how they support those as well. And it's things like our goldenrod. Um, as gardeners, you probably don't like goldenrod in your garden uh, because they can be a bit aggressive, um, but there are species of goldenrod which are more well-behaved. And you can see here that they support 42 different species of uh, specialist bees. Um, not pictured here is they also support 104 different species of caterpillars. Um, that use goldenrod as a host plant. And so those four species right there support a huge number of caterpillars and specialist bees. Um, they are the keystones that support those wide ranges of caterpillars and other insects. And this chart was taken from uh, uh, Doug Tallamy's paper outlining all of this. And what this shows is I just wanna highlight the 82% right there. What this is showing on the left-hand side is you have the number of keystone plants and on the bottom you have the number of plants. Uh, and so this shows that with 15 uh, different species of keystone plants um, that makes up your entire project, you can support 82 different species of uh, moth and butterfly species. If you were to have the same project um, with no keystone plants, you would need 50 different species of plants to support that same amount of uh, caterpillars and moths. And so that really goes to show the impact that these guys can have. Just including 15 of these can support 82% of all Lepidoptera, moth and butterfly species. And so you must be thinking, well, now that I know what I can do, where do I start? Uh, and the simple, uh, the simple answer is with your lawn. Uh, according to a 2005 study, uh, there are 32 million acres of irrigated lawn within the United States. Uh, it's the most irrigated crop in the United States, and it takes about 200 gallons of fresh water per person per day. 
Uh, that's bad news for the drought stricken West. That's bad news for the drought sticking Cape Cod um, that, you know, is using their drinking water to keep all this grass green. Uh, and this is from 2005. So those numbers are uh, likely much larger than that. Um, and lawns are great for some things like play areas, but most areas of lawns are not necessary. Uh, they're great for um, soccer and wiffle ball. The great uh, backyards are great for dogs and kids running around. I have a backyard and that's where I run with my dog. Uh, but most areas you don't really need. And so what you can do is identify areas that you don't need. Um, either ones that you don't really use, uh, like at the Hay Conservation Center, we didn't really use the front yard or the side yard or the backyard. Um, we don't have, although we do have dogs here, we don't have them running around and playing. We don't have a bunch of kids running around and playing. And so what we decided to do is shrink it and change it into a native pollinator meadow. Uh, this is the first year photo um, full of black eyed Susans, which are one of those keystone plants. Um, and it's gonna turn into a lot more over the coming years. Uh, I did the same thing in my own yard. Uh, this was an area that sloped, it got really soggy. It was just a pain uh, to mow. And the grass never ever really did well there anyway. Um, so I, I worked with my mom and I changed this unproductive area that was a pain to manage into a beautiful uh, pocket meadow full of black-eyed Susans and Coreopsis and uh, foxglove beard tongue and milkweeds. And now I can stand out there in the middle of the day and I see dozens of different kinds of bees and dragonflies and birds all flying around. Um, it's really, really cool to behold. If you don't have a lot of lawn to give, uh, what you can do is uh, you can work in your own garden. Uh, you are gardeners, so I assume you do have a garden. Um, and a lot of common invasive species were actually brought here for the ornamental trade. Um, and those are things like burning bush or privet, uh, even Chinese silvergrass. That's one that I see all the time everywhere. Um, and these are things that you can just cut out of your garden and replace them with their native with their native counterparts. Things like blueberry, chokeberries, huckleberries can replace burning bush. Uh, inkberry, winterberry, all of those can take a pruning and replace privet. Uh, and switchgrass, big blue stem, little blue stem, all of those can replace Chinese silver grass. So if you don't have lawn, you can focus on what's in your own garden um, and kind of work with what you got there. Uh, and that's what we're doing at, the, uh, at a couple of our properties. Uh, this is a photo of the Dowling property on Lower Road, right next to the cemetery. Uh, you can see here that it is just a tangled mess of invasive vines and just, uh, just an eyesore, honestly. Uh, and so what we did was we worked with AmeriCorps Cape Cod and we did a huge removal. Uh, and this was a couple, about a month after that removal in April. And we have um, a couple common milkweed uh, plants popping right back up. Uh, and that's important because if you remember, milkweed is the host plant for the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterfly populations have declined 80% uh, since like 1990. Um, and so the more milk we have, the more monarchs. Uh, and that was only possible because we were able to remove all of the invasives. Here's another front view of it. Again, you can see the vines just growing in the trees and it's just a tangled mess. And here's a photo of it a few days ago. Um, and now all of that yellow, that's all goldenrod, which is one of those uh, keystone plants uh, starting to move in and get established. Now the invasive ones are still there. Uh, they're gonna take a long time to control. Uh, we're just gonna continue to cut them back. And over time, we're gonna allow the natives to move in and really become established. Uh, when I took this photo, it was uh, full of a lot of wasps, a lot of bees, a lot of uh, beetles, things like that. They're really everywhere. And so how do you start? Uh, well, I'm not gonna give you a step-by-step -step guide, but I am gonna talk about um, some of the layers of how you start. Uh, and so just like uh, cakes or ogres, our own forests have layers, and, and those layers are things like the ground, the herbaceous layer, which are flowers and grasses, shrubs, and finally the canopy. And so I'm going to take you through each step and talk about how, um, how you can address these, uh, the, how you can start rebuilding um, the pillars of our ecosystems at each level. Uh, and so when you do that, when you go to rebuild our ecosystem, you got to work with what you got. And if you're unfamiliar, 
the Cape was made uh, by glaciers tens, tens of thousands of years ago. I think about 12,000 years ago is when it finally receded. Uh, and so what those glaciers did is they rolled over the North America, like big bulldozers and ground up all the bedrock uh, and they deposited all of, all of that stuff onto the Cape. Uh, and that results in us having these really thin sandy soils, uh, which make water uh, and other things move very quickly uh, and makes everything very, very dry. That's one of the reasons why our freshwater ponds and things are uh, becoming so polluted because all of the septic tanks are leaching and they're just moving very, very quickly into those um, ponds and streams. They don't have enough time to sort of dissipate or get eaten or uh, get used up by organisms or plants or anything like that. And so what these hot and really dry conditions uh, have resulted in, um, it's really like low grade wildfires coming in and just overall really, really hardy area. And what happens is that those, the plants that, um, that evolved here, our milkweeds, our goldenrods, our pitch pine, our oaks, well, they have evolved and adapted to these conditions. So that makes them very, very hardy as well. Uh, and that means when you incorporate a lot of these species into your landscapes, you don't need the same amount of fertilizer. You don't need the same amount of water as some other maybe non-native plants do, or maybe your turf grass does. Uh, because again, when you work with what you got, you don't really need to add anything to it. And then the next layer is uh, the flowers and grasses. And this is, these are the stars of the show. This is where the party starts. <laughs> uh, this is really where people begin to see the difference of what native plants can do. Um, they do everything from attract pollinators to beneficial insects like wasps and hoverflies. Uh, birds eat the seeds um, and they just, they do a lot of things. Um, they, some of the relationships, the ecological relationships that um, flowers and grasses uh, provide are things like this pictured here at the Eddie Sisters. Um, I, this photo is actually a mistake. I was only going to take a photo of this wasp right here. Uh, and then back at the office, I noticed everything else. And this is a fantastic photo because I think it really shows, um, it shows how much one plant can support. Uh, like I said, I was focused on the wasp and that's a golden digger wasp. Uh, it's an important pollinator, controls things like uh, locusts and uh, grasshoppers. Uh, then we have uh, this caterpillar here is the asteroid, um, the asteroid moth. Uh, its host plant is goldenrod. Uh, and the more caterpillars you have, the more birds you have. And so it's seen here uh, munching away and growing and will soon grow into uh, a butterfly. Uh, right in front of it, that little dark spot, that's a jagged ambush bug. That's a predator that uh, eats things like house flies, like mosquitoes, or aphids. Um, and sometimes it can even um, attack like pollinators and smaller bees. Uh, and so predators serve important roles in the ecosystem, and they're typically a good indicator that the ecosystem's doing really well, because uh, you got to think they need a lot, they have to eat a lot of stuff, and so their ecosystem needs to support a lot of stuff. And then finally, we have uh, the common eastern bumblebee right up here. Bumblebees, like I said, are one of our most uh, efficient pollinators. They love uh, goldenrods. And a, a recent study actually showed that goldenrods and also sunflowers uh, can dramatically reduce parasitic infections among bumblebees, uh, which helps keep their population steady and uh, improve that biodiversity. So in this one photo, I was able to capture four different kinds of species and highlight their four different kinds of uh, web interactions. Uh, and then circling back to that golden digger wasp, like I said, they control things like this, a Carolina grasshopper, which is a minor agricultural pest. Um, uh, native species also attract things like this green lacewig, uh, pictured here on a eastern primrose or evening primrose. Um, they also attract things like hoverflies, which if you are a gardener, you want to, uh, you want to be able to attract things like hoverflies and green lacewigs because they control these things, which are aphids. Um, and if you've ever tried to grow on tomatoes, you've probably dealt with aphids before. And so just one plant is able to attract all of these different things and feed on all of these other guys. And they also attract uh, spider wasps and spider wasps are good. Not only are they pollinators, but they're also predators. And exactly as their name hints to, they control spiders. 
um, right here is a crab spider. That is a predator of bumblebees and other things. It's interesting. It doesn't use webs. Uh, it's just, it's like the jagged ambush uh, bug. It just ambushes things. Um, there are certain kinds of crab spiders that can actually change the color of uh, their skin, their exoskeleton, uh, from white to yellow and similar to goldenrod, which in my opinion is very interesting. Uh, and again, just highlighting all of those ecosystem connections just based on that one plant. Uh, they don't, and that's not all they do. Um, our deep rooted native perennials like little blue stem, well, they help things like uh, water infiltrate into the ground. And uh, here is a photo of a lot of our native um, prairie plants. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple, uh, like our little blue stem here which um, has a root system that goes down six, six and a half feet, or our uh, switchgrass, which roots go down uh, 10, almost 11 feet. Then things like our golden rods, whose roots reach down about seven feet. And that all compares to uh, turf grass, which roots go down less than a foot. And so you can see that all of these plants, not only do they support a huge number of insects and things and create a really biodiverse ecosystem, they also, those deep roots can do things like slow stormwater runoff, like in those major storms that we'll be seeing. Uh, they also absorb a lot of nutrients from our septic tanks and helps um, reduce pollution going into our waterways. Uh, those deep and fibrous root networks, that's a lot of material, that's a lot of carbon that gets sucked up like a sponge and um, put down into the soil and held there. Um, and so just by incorporating a couple plants, not only do you support biodiversity, you're also supporting water quality, or not supporting, solving water quality degradation and help mitigating the impacts of climate change. And so we go up one other layer in the uh, cake and we get to the shrub layer. Uh, and this is the intersection of food, flowers and flying things. Uh, and this is also where um, alternatives to common invasives come in. Um, this is where things like our high bush blueberry plant, which I highlighted on that chart, that's a keystone plant. Uh, it's one of my favorite shrubs. They not only support um, pollinators like the Eastern bumblebee pictured here, uh, but they're also, like I said, the early season pollen. Uh, our pollinators, much like ourselves, need three square meals. <laughs> and so that means they need um, pollen and nectar in the spring, the early spring, when they're coming out of hibernation, in the midsummer, when they are um, reproducing and everything like that, their hives are a buzz, uh, and then in the fall, when they're getting ready for migration or for uh, hibernation. And so, high bush blueberry plants, they support those pollinators, but they also support bees. You know, their berries, not only are they delicious, but they also. Um, are eaten by like 30 different kinds of birds, robins, cardinals, sing, things like that. Um, and then, like I said, high bush blueberry, it's also a great alternative to uh, burning bush pictured here. Uh, this is one that I see everywhere. And if you were to replace all of the burning bushes with high bush blueberry plants or huckleberry or winterberry, we could support hundreds of different kinds of species uh, and get a great snack. Uh, and so the layer after that, we finally get to our canopy layer, our trees. Uh, they say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Uh, the second best time to plant a tree is today. Um, and our trees are sort of the pinnacle of our ecosystems. They support the most amount of uh, biodiversity. They support the most amount of ecosystem services. Um, most habitats are slowly moving towards forests and things like that. Um, and they are just really fantastic. And you don't need uh, a hundred year old oak tree um, to get all of those benefits. Planting them in a few years, you'll start to see a lot of the same, same uh, things. And so well, what, the, what are some of those ecological connections? Uh, like I said, they support the most amount of moth and butterfly species with the mighty oak uh, being far and away the best. Oak support 436 different kinds of species of Lepidoptera of moth and butterflies uh, and 436 different kinds when you're talking about biodiversity uh, and biodiversity is strength in numbers, that's a lot. And that doesn't even count animals like the squirrels or the chipmunks or the woodpeckers. 
um, and the salamanders that use oak, oaks for food and habitat. So one tree can support over 400 different kinds of species. Um, pines pictured here um, can support 200 different kinds of species. Uh, that's a downy woodpecker who's uh, probably looking for some grubs or something underneath the bark. Uh, so just one tree, trees can just support just a magnitude more than uh, everything else. Not only that, uh, but they also sequester carbon. You know, when we're talking about uh, climate change, you hear a lot about carbon sequestration and you hear a lot about people saying plant a tree because it'll help mitigate it. Uh, and it's true, although they are not the answer, they can help mitigate climate change and also solve a lot of our other problems like um, mitigating some of the effects like reducing surrounding air temperatures or reducing air pollution, things that are going to be made much worse, especially in our cities, and our towns. Um, if you are a homeowner, planting a tree can help lower your energy bill because of the shade that's provided. Uh, they also slow and filter stormwater runoff. Uh, you know, if we're talking about root systems, the root systems of an oak is about twice as wide, is about the same uh, width of the canopy, and they go so much further down. And they use a lot of water, they help slow a lot of water. And so they address all of these issues that we're having troubles with, having trouble with while addressing biodiversity. And so you're probably thinking, John, what about the area of the lawn, of the lawn that I can't give up? You know, I do have kids, I do have grandkids, I do have a dog that needs to run around and, and, and play. Well, you can uh, landscape that in an ecologically sound manner. Uh, you can leave the leaves. If you have an oak tree, you have had leaves on your lawn before. You don't need to pay someone to blow those away and bag them up and take them, take them away. Um, because one, it's free, <laughs> free compost. Uh, all you have to do is uh, just mow, um, mow over them and they'll eventually break down and return their nutrients back into the soil and enrich uh, the soil that the lawn um, is on, reducing the need for things like fertilizer. Uh, additionally, you don't want to do that because many insects use leaf litter as overwinter habitat, like the red hair streak moth pictured here. Uh, they're also, they insulate the ground for ground uh, nesting bees, like uh, the metallic sweet bee pictured here, or sweat bee. Um, and you don't need to leave the leaves everywhere. You don't need to leave them all over your car or all in your driveway. Uh, if you put them in certain spots, if you do want to get rid of most of them, you can use them as mulch. You can put them in your garden beds. You can put them underneath your trees to provide a soft landing, <laughs> excuse me, for a lot of those insects like the red hair streak. Um, if you, you leave the leaves, you do all those things, and then you take a look at what actually makes up your lawn. Um, if you use a regular blend of grass seed mix from, you know, Agway, it's probably not the best. They do have specialized grass seed mixes for things that are much more drought tolerant or short growing. So you don't have to mow it as much. You don't have to give it so much water. Uh, you can also incorporate things like clover, which um, fixes nitrogen, stays green throughout the year. Uh, it can withstand a little bit of traffic, not as much as grasses. Um, and it also can help keep your own grass green. Um, so if you start incorporating a lot of those different seed blends into your own lawn, you'll reduce your need for water, fertilizer, and even maintenance. Uh, and you can cut it high when you do maintenance it. Uh, there's a one-to-one -one root to blade length ratio. So the higher you cut your grass, the deeper the roots are, which make them more uh, resilient to things like drought and overall the less water uh, is required. So for areas of your lawn, like I said, leave the leaves, they're free compost. If you're having someone take them away, you're getting robbed twice because they're um, you have to pay them to take money away from you, essentially. All that stuff over time is just going to lead to a, um, a healthier soil that's not as dry as uh, the ones we have on the Cape. And so just, uh, just a few takeaways here. Uh, I want to revisit this quote that I talked about um, when I first mentioned biodiversity loss. Um, nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented and an estimated on 1 million species are now threatened with extinction. Uh, that is not the entire quote. Uh, the entire quote is, but there's still hope. All of the issues that we're facing today, the climate change, the water degradation, biodiversity loss, they are large and complex and honestly overwhelming. But incorporating native plants into our ecosystems, into our landscapes, into our backyards, 
they are one of the best things that we can do, not only because they support biodiversity, they uh, help mitigate water quality degradation, and they help uh, mitigate climate change, but they are personal uh, changes that we can see. They are, we can see the difference that they make in our own backyard. And that sort of, that sort of change, that sort of difference, I think that gives everybody hope. And it can be so easy to just sit back and say, oh, whatever, you know, we're all screwed anyway, so what's the point? Um, but I promise you, if you start incorporating more native plants into your gardens, into your lawns, you will be astounded by the effects and um, you'll have a new and vigor to keep going. You'll have a better conservation ethic, you know? Uh, and so what are my takeaways? Um, what, I, what do I want you to take away from this? Uh, reduce your lawn to areas that uh, you only need. Again, just kind of keep them to those wiffle ball soccer areas. Um, plant native keystone plants. Not only do we need native plants, we need keystone plants as well. Um, that's things like black-eyed Susans, golden rods, oak trees, um, and then remove invasive plants in your landscape and replace them with the native versions. Uh, native plants were brought here because uh, they're really pretty um, or for they can take a pruning like privet, but are the native counterparts, not only are they really pretty, but um, the interactions that they support are also really beautiful. You know, it's really cool seeing a whole yard filled with fireflies, or it's really cool seeing bumblebees um, buzz out the pollen of the bell-shaped flowers, the high bush blueberry. And personally to me, that is much prettier than the way burning bush looks in the fall. Uh, also high bush blueberry is the same color in the fall, so might as well use that one, right? Uh, and then manage your lawn in an ecologically sound manner. Uh, Leave the leaves, no pesticides, no fertilizers, and drought tolerant and short growing grasses. Again, every time you use pesticides, you're targeting one, but you're killing all the others. Uh, every time you use fertilizer, um, most of it just washes away into our uh, streams and our, our ponds. Uh, so when you landscape your lawn, you can do it essentially the not ecologically sound way and contribute to all of these problems that we're seeing, or you can do it in an ecologically sound manner and help solve all of the problems that we're seeing. Um, that is what I had for you today. And I just wanna introduce you to the Howie dog. He is another species that uh, benefits from uh, pollinator meadows such as that. Um, this is my contact information for any questions relating to what I discussed. Uh, I think I also uh, included a quick Q&A um, sheet for Durkee uh, in case anyone has any common questions that I typically hear. Uh, thank you all again for um, letting me come at you virtually. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.